Okay. Oh, good. But good enough English understands reading and writing, just uh, verb tenses and things like that, just uh, not up to par. So they've determined that long term English would be good for them. So long term English starts in April in Montana. Oh, here. Okay. So they come here? They or? come here and they're in, Mon in Montana from April to the end of July. Hmm. And then there's a shorter English program that's at Kansas and that starts in that's just June or July. Okay. So okay. And then they start here. And August. then they come here. Yeah. Okay. And they'll be here in early August. We're bringing them in a little I'm gonna do it a little differently this year. Bring them in a little earlier than normal so they can get settled into their apartments and not be so So what's crazy. the deal with like apartments this year were different and harder. What's is well it's just say? different. Um so the um Roosevelt Point didn't have any room for them. Um, Roosevelt um, Point has an agreement with ASU to be the overflow for Taylor Place. ASU is actually building another dorm, finally, but it won't be open until the fall of 2021. So, but there has been a huge influx in apartment buildings. So there are even more now than there were a year ago. So, But they're not furnished, right? Some might be, but some are not. So it just depends on what we can do. So anyway, so the fuel Okay. Well, maybe it's five to seven. You know what? I might drop by the shower. Because we'll probably go to the not yet. I want this like to be the well, edge. Is that good? Better than it was? Okay. When you guys are found, same time you don't I had a little bit of on the Yes. 
So I'll, I do, yes. Okay, so I just give it to you. Okay. 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 Hi, how are you? Hi, 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 hi. hi. Hey, nice to meet you. So you're going to see uh, the big dot. Four hours. Four hours. Yeah, you probably should. Not a lot of TV. We saw him on the home of our house. We did it here. Yeah. 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 I apologize if you're going to answer this. Thank you. Sir. Is there a meatball? We're about to meet the other guy. Yeah. I don't I do I I know. I I know. I I know. I I know. I I well
Uh, good afternoon, everyone here in the Cronkite School of Room 444, and those of you who are joining us online or later on uh, the YouTube channel, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Cronkite Global Conversations. This is the 10th year of the Humphrey Program at the Walter Cronkite School and the 40th year of the Humphrey Program in total, so we're always grateful to have people interested in global affairs and, and uh, global topics. We certainly have one of those today. We appreciate those who are in the audience, which represent people who have reached out to the Humphrey Fellows and become friendship families or faculty mentors or teachers or scholars. And uh, always a special shout out to our Cronkite Global team, Jen Holland, Malcolm, and Elizabeth Blackburn, who really do so much work behind the scenes and never get any of the credit. So. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> um, Jan's got cookies for you, but more importantly, she's got something for you to sign, and that helps keep uh, this whole thing legal and, and appropriate with the State Department. We just want to find out who's here, not because we're spying on you, but because we need to track who ate the cookies. So, it's, probably, it's probably not a State Department request, it's more of an AG but please do sign in because also we can then email you future events and sadly one of those is coming up later in April when we say goodbye to these wonderful fellows and send them on to great professional affiliation. The topic today is refugees and humanitarian action and we have three experts to help us drill down on what that means. That includes Deus Rahagarario and Pierre uh, Dubonar and of course Mona Ali. Um, the other thing I want to say is how timely this topic is. If we're here in Arizona, which we are in the room, or those of you watching online should Google it, there's a lot of things happening four hours south of here at the border. And a lot of it relates to refugees of all sorts. And that's an important story. And I think it's important that we understand it's a global story. And America has no monopoly on that story. All right, and so last uh, I want to say is thank you for being with us. We will have questions at the end, but uh, they have a very finely tuned presentation. I'll turn it over to Mona to get us introduced. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Dr. It's a pleasure to have you with us here today. Um, as Dr. Bill said, we will be talking about humanitarian action in our countries, Haiti, Egypt, and uh, Uganda. And I would like to introduce our first speaker, which is Pierre from Haiti, and he will start. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pierre Dupineau from Haiti. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about um, the situation of Haitian migrant workers in Dominican Republic. To understand the Haitian migrant workers situation in the Dominican Republic, it's very important to put it into context and to understand that it's very um, relevant to, 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 to have a flashback in the history, in the Haiti's history and Dominican Republic history to, to understand the current situation that is going um, between both countries. As you may know, Haiti and Dominican Republic, they live in the same island. But they are two countries with extreme differences. I'm going to show showing you a picture, a symbolic picture, that summarizes the situation between both countries in the same island. When you look at this picture on the left side, he is Haiti. On the right side is Dominican Republic. <laughs> That's powerful. That speaks volume about what's happening between both countries, envi environmentally and economically speaking. And when we consider key economic indicators uh, about both countries, 
we can see Haiti and the Dominican Republic, they have almost the same population, almost 11 million. Um, Haiti has more than 11 million, and the Dominican Republic has a bit less than 11 million inhabitants. And when we compare life expectancies in Haiti, we can see that in Haiti we have 64 years as life expectancy, while in the Dominican Republic it's 63 um, years. That's a huge gap in terms of life expectancy. And when you compare the gross domestic product for both, both countries, Haiti has only eight no, $9 billion as gross domestic products, while the Dominican Republic has $80 billion. This comparison can easily tell you about uh, why the situation is what it is. Um, to understand the migration issues and the borderlands issues between both countries, it's very important as I, as, I, um, uh, as I told at the beginning of my presentation, the historic context um, of both countries. Haiti took its independence on 1804. But quite after Haiti's independence, the international community, they imposed um, an embargo on Haiti. The greatest nations didn't want to recognize Haiti independence. And Haiti took its independence from France. France requested to recognize Haiti's, um, the independence of Haiti. They requested Haiti to pay a debt, a compensation, in order to recognize Haiti, Haiti's independence. I don't know if you, if you get it. Let me explain it to you um, um, better. It's like, you were you were, you were my slave. You you fought for your for your freedom. You took your freedom from me, and I ask you to pay me <laughs> in order for me to recognize you as free. It's insane. It's nonsensical, but it's what happened at that time. And I didn't know. I don't know what happened in the back of the mind of Hades president at that time. The guy accepted to pay friends. <laughs> $21 billion to recognize Haiti's independence. And that was the shocking point that gonna lead to all, to most of the challenging, challenging issue, issues that Haiti is gonna face later on. Because of that debt, Haiti spent all the 19th century working only to pay friends. Because of that, the country couldn't try for its um, for for prosperity and for economic development. And aside from struggling to gather the money to pay friends, we we went on knowing a lot of instability, social, political conflicts from time to time. And while Haiti was struggling to try to 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 to, to be stable economically and politically, the worst part of the island that which became um, the Dominican Republic, they started to organize themselves and they took their independence from Haiti because Haiti, the, the island was a world until 1844 and it was under Haiti's leadership, both sides of, of the island. And on 1944, the Dominican Republic took um, its independence and since, the, since then, the conflicts between both sides of the island never stopped. And as a result of, as a consequences of um, the economic challenging challenges that Haiti was, have, has been facing um, during all the 19th century and the 20th century, at the beginning of the uh, 20th, 20th century, um, the economic situation get worse. And thousands of Haitian people started to migrate to Dominican Republic. And as Haiti was not able to, to keep paying friends for the compensation, so the compensation, I have to, um, press, um, to specify that the compensation was paid to US banks. 
and especially from the uh, to um, Citibank. And as Haiti couldn't keep paying Citibank, the U.S. state decided to invade the country and settle during two decades in Haiti um, from 1915 to 1934. <laughs> so do, in 19 30, during the Great Depression that affected um, la, uh, most of the greatest countries in the world. And you can imagine that uh, Haiti as a very weak country was very hit by the Great Depression. And at that time, thousands of Haitian people um, flew to Dominican Republic and because of the amount of Haitian arriving to the Dominican Republic, in um, 1937, um, the first massive killing of the Haitian people um, was carried out by Trujillo, with, who was a very powerful dictator in the Dominican Republic. So the, the decades, um, decades later, Haiti keep struggling we did during the 50s, the 60s, uh, the 80s, the, the economic situation worsened. And at the beginning of the 80s, you may know, you may have heard about the phenomenon of Haitian boat people, when thousands of Haitian people um, took the boat to try to, to get to, to the US um, uh, lands. And be, uh, as a, what happened at that time, it was because of the economic situation, a rural population start to migrate from rural zone to Port-au-Prince, the capital. So um, to the point that Port-au-Prince was overpopulated and the economic situation worsened because of that. And the only way that Haiti, Haitian food keep living is whether to, to, to migrate to the Dominican Republic or whether to migrate to other countries. And maybe you have heard about Haitian boat people, but today I want to put a face on Haitian boat people. I don't know if you have, if you know this guy. You don't know this guy? <laughs> this guy is my, is my father. <laughs> <laughs> And he was a boat people. He was part of a trip in 19, 1911. And, and the boat um, shipwrecked and he almost died. And we lost most of our family members in that trip. Um, and we lost all, our, all of our resources after this incident. Thankfully, my, 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 my father didn't. Um, that and um, fortunately, he helped me to be where I am today with you. And I thank I thank him a lot for having helping me to to be where I am today in life. So um, there is two other facts that I have to highlight that gonna help us to understand better the the, the situation the migration uh, issues and borderline issues between um, um, Dominican Republic and Haiti was first of all, the second occupation of, of the US in Haiti in 19, between 1911 and 1994, uh, and the embargo imposed by the UN on Haiti. And the third event that gonna really impact um, the migration um, problem, problematic in Haiti and between Haiti and Dominican Republic is the earthquake. After the earthquake, most Haitian people, they lost all they, they had as resources and they started to flee to Dominican Republic. To the point that because of the huge amount of Haitian people in Dominican Republic after specifically the, the earthquake. Um, according to, to a survey um, carried out by, by the uh, Dominican Republic government, eight, 800,000 of immigrants um, 
there are 800,000 of immigrants in the Dominican Republic and 80%, 89%, 88% of that amount are Haitian. And because of the, the huge presence of Haitian in, in, in Dominican Republic, they're going to took a ruling, a court ruling is going to deprive Haitian for from their Dominican citizenship. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about later, but now I'm going, I actually, let, let's talk about the role that Haitian people play in Dominican Republic economy. Um, Haitian, 91% of Haitian people are economically active in Dominican Republic and they, um, they are working in farming sector, construction and informal trading. And 80% of Haitian workforce contribute to um, Dominican Republic economy. And there are some pictures that can show you um, in what sectors Haitian work in Dominican Republic, farming and construction, as I told um, uh, before, and tr uh, informal trading. And aside from Haitian migrant workers in Dominican Republic, the population, the communities around the borders, also they rely on Republican, on uh, Dominican Republic um, to supply themselves in good and basic uh, products. And this picture show you people waiting for uh, the, the gate to be open so they can enter to the public market in Dominican Republic to um, provide, to uh, supply themselves of basic goods and products. If we compare the commercial, ba the commercial balance between Haiti and Republic, uh, Dominican Republic, we can see Dominican Republic export $1 billion of goods to Haiti, while Haiti only export $20 million. That's a very, very huge gap between in the commercial balance between both countries. I was talking about um, the ruling that the Dominican Republic took in 20, um, 2013 to we, we actually deprive thousands of Haitian people uh, from their Dominican citizenship. That was a very huge issue because to, um, the UN um, threatened Dominican Republic to uh, of section, and despite of the sections, Dominican Republic started to deport um, to to do massive deportation. And in 2000, between 2013 and 2015, 400,000 Haitian people was deported to Haiti from Dominican Republic, and on a, on a daily basis, 200. The uh, Haitian people keep crossing the border to go to Dominican Republic. And actually, what is the new destination? What is the new tendency, migration tendency in Haiti? Now, Dominican Republic is not um, the main destination of Haitian. For those who have the means, they start going to Chile, uh, Brazil, and Mexico, and other. Uh, island in the Caribbean and the Latin American region. Now I'm going to switch to Mona, that we, we're going to introduce you to the situation of uh, refugees in Egypt. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the situation of refugees in Egypt as a host and transit country. So as some of you may know, Egypt is part of the MENA regions, the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region. It's a North African country in the MENA region. And it spans the north um, uh, eastern corner of Africa, bridging into the south, uh, the south um, western corner of Asia. We are a population of 100 million people living in a total area of 100 kilometers uh, square, uh, 1 million kilometers square. But actually, we don't live in all that area. We are all huddled around the River Nile that runs across the middle uh, eastern part of, of Egypt. 
95% of the population lives around the Nile, leaving, uh, sorry, 5%, uh, um, 95% of the population lives in this 5% of land, and the 95% of the, of the rest of it is a desert. And the official religion is Islam. Uh, about 80 to 85% of the population is Muslim, and there's a significant minority of Orthodox Christians which is about 10 to 15 percent. If you were, compare, to, were to compare Egypt to as part of the, of the US, this is where it would fit in. So imagine a third of the US population living in California and part of Nevada and Arizona. So it's a pretty populous country. Egypt is also a cultural trendsetter uh, of the Arabic speaking world. If you ask any Arabic speaking person, they would definitely know about Umm Kulthum, which is an internationally acclaimed singer. Ahmed Ziad, a contemporary uh, singer as well, and Nabil Mahfouz, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, who's a writer and author. And so I have also a multi talented actress. And throughout the uh, uh, 50s and 60s, Egyptian media and culture has permeated the Arab-speaking world. So everybody knows the Egyptian dialects and even the humor used in popular movies. And this explains why many Syrian refugees choose Egypt as a destination company, a, a country to, to uh, uh, seek asylum. Um, 250,000 refugees and asylum seekers are recorded in Egypt from 57 countries as of this year. Uh, and actually 50% of these refugees come from Syria and the rest of them come from different Sub-Saharan Af uh, African uh, countries and as well as Yemen and Iraq. But 250,000 is the officially communicated number. The official, the unofficial number experts say is double that, so it's about 500,000. Uh, to backtrack a little bit and to give you an idea of how Egypt uh, reached an agreement with the UNHCR about its state as a transit country for refugees, it all started with the EU requesting that the countries of the MENA region uh, build asylum centers that, like the ones that are that you know about in Europe. So basically, a refugee who would be fleeing their country, running away from conflict and killings, and whatever they're running away from, would go to uh, a European country, thinking that they would find peace there and they can start anew, only to be captivated and put in this large concentration center. And maybe some of you know about what the situation in these concentration camps or refugee camps is like in Europe. It's not, it's not good. Um, I have had an experience of going to a camp in Greece on the island of Lesbos in 2017, and it was called, it's called the Moria Refugee Camp. If you Google Moria Refugee Camp, you would find the word living hell popping out a lot. It's a terrible camp. I'm not saying that all, all refugee camps are like that in Europe, but this is the experience that I've been to. So the Moria camp was built to be a prison, it was originally a prison. And it was built to accommodate 2,000 people. When I was there in 2017, 8,000 refugees were living there. And as we speak today, 14,000 refugees live in this camp that's originally supposed to hold 2,000 people. So they live in this camp and the surrounding. So you can imagine how terrible it is. Um, living in a refugee camp actually is adding insult to injury, like I told you. So these people are fleeing with or their psychological trauma, leaving family behind that were killed and all sorts of, of, of horrible things happen to them. Um, these two pictures were taken by my colleague and friend who was also volunteering in this, um, in this refugee camp. 
our role was to be uh, interpreters on the medical team. We would act as interpreters between the English medical team and the Arabic speaking refugees who were seeking medical uh, help. And this happened to be in uh, a psychological consulting session. The first guy is an Egyptian actually who fled the country because he was tortured by the regime. And he was pouring his heart out about his mental disabilities and the, 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 the troubles he's facing with his peers in the refugee camp because they make fun of him and his idiosyncrasies and how he can't stop himself from drinking shampoo and things like that. The other guy is an Afghani whose um, mother and father's limbs have been amputated and his father and his um, brother died. And now he had to go to a detention center where he was treated like in a detention center. So it's not a great thing. Luckily for refugees in Egypt, they do not have to go through that because they do not live in asylum and in, 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 in camps. And that is because of a memorandum of understanding between Egypt, the Egyptian government, and the UNHCR which uh, says uh, that the UNHCR it, it documents refugees on behalf of the Egyptian government and then it encourages refugees to uh, seek a residence permit from the, uh, from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it's a, renew a renewable residence permit, residency permit, it's six months. And the reason why <laughs> Um, refugees are integrated into society really is not because Egypt cares about them probably it's because as you know it's a logistically and uh, financially burdening responsibility to build these asylums and to take care of these re refugees in these asylums so as I said it's uh, they get a residence permit renewable every six months and they have complete access to health care, public health care, and Arabic speaking uh, refugees like Yemenis, Syrians, and Iraqis, they have access to public school education. However, uh, many or most of these refugees, they come to Egypt as a transit uh, country. Their destination is probably somewhere in Europe. But only 3,176 refugees were submitted for resettlement in 2019, and only 1,600 of them actually made it out of the country, which leaves us with, you remember how many they were officially? They're like 250,000 people or double the number still living in the country. So what do they do? It's actually good news for the Egyptian economy. It's been reported uh, in 2017 by a U in a UN report that Syrian refugees injected $800 million into the economy since the conflict started back in 2011-2012. And Syrian refugees who come to Egypt, some of them, many of them actually, I can't say many, but some of them are actually more affluent. So they had the opportunity to come to Egypt via airfare. They didn't have to come on a boat or anything. And they have pretty decent lives. And many of them are able to make investments and open businesses and provide jobs for other Syrian refugees who are looking for, for jobs who cannot find them. And other, uh, they actually excel in some of the industries in Egypt. They um, have the best shawarma places. Syrian shawarma is pretty popular in Egypt. And they have pastry shops. They make the best uh, Middle Eastern delicacies. Mm -hmm. And they're also very good in the textile industry. And if you ask an Egyptian about what they feel about Syrian refugees and having them in the country, many people will tell you that they love Syrians because they're hard workers. They contribute to the economy. They uh, are very good salesmen. They're sweet talkers. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they, Egyptians, they, they just love them. We don't have any problem with them. Um, 
unless they are outrivaling their Egyptian peers in, in other economic activities, <laughs> as one economist said, Manal Ashri. Um, but it's not really a huge problem. They no, they're not putting anybody out of business or anything. It's just a matter of competition. Uh, the Egyptian uh, government has tried to make it a little bit more difficult to enter the country, like raising the visa entry fees and things like that, but they're still coming in and there's no problem with refugees, Syrian refugees. Uh, these are two examples of businesses, many of the, of some of the, the, the many businesses that refugees have opened in the country. The first one is a Sudanese uh, refugee uh, who came to the country and opened a peanut butter startup. The second one is the owner, he's a Syrian guy, he owns a very popular street style Syrian food restaurant in an affluent neighborhood in Egypt. And this picture was actually taken from the opening, the ad for an opening for another branch. Um, but it's not all rainbows and butterflies for refugees in Egypt. Um, some of the less affluent Syrians have had to deal with the devaluation of the Egyptian pound in 2016, and that was an IMF uh, loan condition where uh, the Egyptian pound used to be equal to, sorry, one US dollar used to be equal to eight Egyptian pounds. After the devaluation, it doubled, and prices in the country almost tripled for everyone. So this hit them hard and people who were barely trying to make ends meet were actually being living in debt. In a UN report in 2017, it was recorded that 77% of Syrian families had debts. It's also not great for Sub-Saharan Africans and non-Arabic speakers in Egypt. Um, they are unable to join the workforce as seamlessly as Syrians because they have the language barrier. Um, even the ones who do speak Arabic, they are made fun of on the streets and harassed and bullied. Uh, they tend to live in more humble areas where people are not educated and are not aware. And it's easy to um, be subjected to harassment if, if, if you're a child or a woman walking on the street and you cannot protect yourself. So this is, I mean, unfortunately, this is to say that many Egyptians tend to be racist people against people who are of a darker skin tone, which is weird, but it's true. Uh, this is a screenshot of a viral video, a video that went viral on TikTok and Facebook last year about a teenager, an Egyptian teenager who was bullying a Sudanese uh, student who was going to school. And this uh, video sparked so much controversy. It went viral and everybody was furious on social media about how this kid was harassed. And it did generate a presidential response actually. President El Sisi or his PR team, so to speak, made this uh, had this great idea of hosting uh, the Sudanese child in one of the conferences that were taking place at the time. It was an internationally covered conference, conference uh, the Youth Forum, and President Sisi sat the Sudanese uh, teenager, teenager beside him for most of the conference to show the world that Egyptians are great people. <laughs> And there are other uh, governmental and UNICEF anti-bullying campaigns that um, arise, not just a result, as a result of this, but it also impacted and, and started a conversation about refugees who are being bullied um, in, 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 in Egyptian streets. Uh, there were also other uh, local international and international efforts to mainstream refugees. Um, the first one is a picture of a group of Syrian women who take um, professional development courses to uh, in, in the beauty industry. And it's done, it's a, it's a local nonprofit that helps them do that. 
the one on the right is a governmental initiative for um, national health checkups. And as you can see, uh, um, a sub-Saharan African refugee uh, is, can benefit from that service. And the one at the bottom is a UNICEF initiative of multicultural football. As you can see, there's, uh, they hold these matches between, and they integ integrate Syrians and Egyptians and uh, Sudanese in the same football team to integrate them. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was Egypt, and now uh, Good afternoon, all, and welcome you to this discussion, conversation. I'm Paul Deus David Rohangario from Uganda, and I am about to discuss with you the what the UNHCR calls the refugee model, the Ugandan refugee model. It is called the Ugandan refugee model because we have an open door policy. We receive refugees from all over the world and we do not try to put door to, to, to segregate, segregate among them or to first screen them or things like that. So what happens is that when people run into Uganda, the Ministry, the ministry of, of Disaster Preparedness and Refugees who, have, who work with the Office of the Prime Minister, work with UNHCR and using the UNHCR trucks, they transport those people to a given settlement. There are many settlements throughout the country. So when they reach in these settlements, the government allocates pieces of land to households so that these households can now start living a seemingly same life as if they were at home. And the refugees who have some funds, they are encouraged to start any business they want. So the UNHCR calls it the, the Ugandan model, and they are trying to, to study this model to make sure that it could be replicated in other countries. Because many refugees are suffering because of some policies that are not favorable, and people really, the human face, people are suffering because of such a policies. And in my country, as, as, as at the end of January 2020, we had over 1.3 million people. And the UNHCR projects that by the end of 2020, we shall have 1.7 million people. Uh, so this is the map of my country. Uh, showing, and it's a small country, by the way, it's around 123,000 square miles, uh, showing the areas where some of the refugees are located. The southern Sudan, where we get 1,740,000, and then from western Uganda, where we have over 500,000 refugees, and from southwestern Uganda, where I come from, we have about 42,000 refugees. So the big numbers. In, in, in Africa, Uganda is the leading country at hosting refugees because of our open door policy. And we are the third in the whole world after Turkey and Pakistan. I am happy that uh, two, they are above the two leading the top three countries we are represented to here, including Pakistan, my colleague from Pakistan, that we welcome refugees and make them feel at home. It's something that we are proud of. It is something that our culture supports and we, we are proud of that. Happy kids. So because of these settlements being so huge, they contain schools. They contain 
clinics, health clinics. They contain mosques, they contain churches. So these settlements are like small villages. And we try to make sure that people who are living there, although they are not, although they have many things they lack as refugees, but they try to feel that they are being welcome. They, are, they, they live a seemingly normal life. So these are children who were taken in a, one of the refugees in Northern Uganda. The, the world's largest refugee camp is located in northern Uganda. It is called the BDBD refugee camp, which has over 270,000 people. So this is, this is like a small village. Actually, like a big village. <laughs> <laughs> 270,000 people. And in this, in this camp, uh, this camp came about 2017. There was a very big conflict in South, in South Sudan where two leaders were fighting for power. And, and you know, when two leaders start fighting like that, then people are paying the price. So because we, we allowed them to come in, that resulted into the world's largest refugee camp. But the good thing is that there is a big land up there in the northern Uganda, and we give them land. They, they grow crops, they grow vegetables, they grow fruits, and they supplement the, the, the help they get from UNHCR using the crops they grow. And actually, they also access markets, and they go to sell some extra produce they make from the plots of land they are allocated by the government. So what's the contribution of the refugees to the Ugandan economy? Uh, because we give them land to till and cultivate, they get some extra produce which they take to the markets and maybe they pay, they pay <laughs> market dues, they, 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 sell, they sell crops. So uh, the World Food Program estimates that a household can pay annually around two hundred dollars to the economy, and because we have over one million people, there are very many households that can contribute. And as, and as I say, because the, the refugees don't need work permits in my country, they can do, they can start shops, they can start other businesses they like, maybe catering. Uh, DLC refugees who come from the Democratic Republic of Congo, they like tailoring and they produce very good fabric that they sell and get a livelihood from it. This is one of the pictures that was taken in a BDBD refugee camp. These are Congolese refugees doing uh, tailoring, doing tailoring, and some of the some of the fabric they make can cost up to $25, $25. A good gown, a good gown can cost like $90. And they benefit from that, and the economy benefits from that. This is, this is a tailoring class, because the other refugees have realized that tailors are gaining a lot of money from their work. So the camp camp commandants have decided that they should put a terror in class so that other refugees can also get involved in this business because this fabric which they, they, they make is sold throughout the country. The, the UNHCR tries to help them to distribute their, their materials to other parts of the country so that they can sell for them and they earn money out of it. So this is a class where they can learn and benefit from it. Then this is also an urban refugees learning radio repair. In my country, uh, every household has a small radio, an FM radio. And no one can want that radio to be silent. We have around 500, 500 FM radio stations. So it's the, it's the big mode of communication and and refugees realizing that 
this, there can be a market in, in radio repair. They are encouraged to, to, to learn how to repair these radios so that they can get a fee and earn a living out of it. And mostly of these urban refugees, they come from Somalia and the, Uganda has been doing a lot, a lot in assisting the political situation in Somalia. However, there are challenges definitely that uh, the Ugandan government and the UNHCR and other agencies who are helping are going through. A refugee in Uganda, actually a, a, a usual Ugandan can live on a dollar, one dollar a day. So a refugee, I can, I can think that a refugee, or I can say that a refugee lives on less than that. So resources are a very big challenge. Weather is a very big challenge in my country. Um, drought is unpredictable. So as a, a, an agriculture, agriculture is the leading form of livelihood for most of the people in my country. So if the weather is not predictable, the, sometimes the harvest is not good. So that's a, another big challenge that we go through. And the, the, because of hosting too many people, the, sometimes the sheer volume of arrivals can overwhelm the systems. And you, some can stay some, uh, at a given border for some time because of being too many. You could not get the, the UNHCR vehicles to transport them to a given settlement. So it can be a problem, a short-term problem. And some camps are located very far away from big markets. So those refugees who have produce, they may not access the market because they are located a bit far away from their settlement. And the health centers, the health centers which are in the refugee settlements are not big enough. So they get the referrals. So when they get referrals, it becomes a challenge because they don't have the means of transport to access the big, big hospitals or big health centers. And, and, and of course we have a poor road network in my country. Um, maybe 20% is tarmac, the rest is not. Can be good marm road. And when it is a rainy season, those roads are really impossible. Uh, otherwise, uh, I would like to call upon everyone who is here that giving the UNHCR one dollar is something that means a lot to many people who are living in refugee camps. I, 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 I am not a rich man, but I can give $10. And I assure you that it will do something for a child to, to get a teacher in a refugee camp. Because those teachers who are in a refugee camp, they come from outside of the, the refugee settlement and they are paid separately by the refugee administration. So those teachers need salary, of course, because they are, they are, spending, they are spending time to go in the refugee camps and teach and many other services that are necessary. And last week, the UNHCR announced that they are, in my country, announced that they have run out of money. And my country has, is not going to say, we are closing the border. It is our culture that we cannot stop people from running into our house. So thank you very much as you try to donate to UNHCR. <laughs> Thank you for that clarion call, Dave. Let's have Mona and Pierre and Diaz come back up and, and find you. If you have some questions, which I know you do, I'm also going to pass around Dan's magic sign-up sheet. And if you haven't done it, please do so. Um, who's got a question for any or all of the three? Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, Haiti. Um, I have a simple question. Would you clarify what the life expectancy difference is between the two countries? Almost 10 years. Uh, Excuse me. 
can you repeat the question so that okay. the people on the microphone here? So, yeah. what is the um, difference between Haiti's life expectancy and Dominican Republic life expectancy if you have that? yes um, Stay yeah it's mic. 10 years mm -hmm. 10 years different okay. Haiti is 64 Dominican Republic is um, 73 okay and are the cultures between the two countries different like do they speak the same language mm, have no, the same it's religion it's have the same social values? Um, I didn't um, highlight those indicators because I wanted to grow very fast. Um, no, Haiti, we speak French and Creole. In Dominican Republic, they speak Spanish. Um, that's a very um, important barrier, but that doesn't stop Haitian people to, to go there because we learn language very fast. And because of we have a long uh, border lane, so, um, because of cultural cultural um, exchanges and commercial exchanges, a lot of Haitians speak Spanish. Great, good questions. Four. Yes. Sorry. Oh, well, let's see. First of all, I just wanted to say uh, we just Googled the size of Tucson, and it's one quarter the size of that refugee camp. Wow. Wow. Which is amazing to put it in that perspective. But what does UNCHR stand for? Because I want to make sure I find it. You in? UNHCR, United Nations. United Nations High Commission for Refugees. High Commission for Refugees. Perfect, thank you. Good. Uh, to Mona, I want to ask, uh, you were talking about you, got, you guys have Syrian refugees, Yemeni, Iraqi, but there was no talk about any Palestinians. There were, there were from well, Palestinians have been integrated in society, in society for, like, since a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not familiar with their status. I wouldn't say that they, they don't have the nationality, mm -hmm. but their residency, I'm not really familiar with it because it's kind of old. Also, I want to know what is the sentiment because you said that people are very welcoming in Egypt to you know get the Syrian people, but the time from 2011 to 2012, everybody was talking about the ISIS threat and everything. So, do you guys don't feel or any policy that you guys that feel that it would be a threat for us in that area if their ISIS people come here in the form of refugees or in disguise of them? Well, are you talking socially or politically? Both. I would like to know both. Well, politically, we I have not heard of any, you know, uh, problem being communicated or, or stopping refugees for, from coming in because of the ISIS problem or anything like that. Um, however, there's the military is having, there are a lot of, there's combat going on in certain areas in, in, in Sinai, uh, north of Egypt, with ISIS and fighting, you know, terrorism and all, but it's not, they don't come as refugees, that this is a different area. I have a question. Uh, do you have along the border between Haiti and Dominican Republic, this kind of relation we have seen here in the border where it's people maybe live in one side but work in the other side. Is yes. that mm -hmm. porosity in your border also? It's the same situation because serv basic services are better in, in the Dominican Republic than in Haiti. And in most of crossing point um, of border or communities, they don't have, in Haiti, they don't have the basic services. So, so they have to cross the border. Haitian, uh, for example, women, um, women who, who, who want to give uh, birth, they have to cross to the Dominican Republic to, to give birth. There's a lot of um, children, Haitian children also, um, who, who go to school to the Dominican Republic in, in several communities, borderless communities. Is it pretty easy to cross? I mean, does it, how long does it take? They need a visa? What, yeah. what kind of document? They, they, don't, they, they don't, don't need a visa. It, but if, if they have to cross until Santo Domingo or Santiago, the biggest uh, um, cities, they, they do have. Okay. They, need, they do need a visa to go until there. But if they want to, um, there is specific days for public markets. Um, but if they want to have um, specific services around the border and in, co in Dominican Republic communities,
they're close to the border, they don't have, they don't need visa. Yes, sir. Uh, Mona, given the success of the Syrian refugees in Egypt, have, have you seen or have you been hearing that some of the refugees from Arab countries that went to Europe are now seeking to come to Egypt uh, as a better place to find their future? I have not heard of that. And usually the final destination is Europe. So I think many of them would be coming to Egypt as a transit country in order to eventually go to Europe. So those who make it to Europe, I don't think they would come back to Egypt because at least for the economic situation, it's not, it's not great. I have a question for Dils. I, I wonder, uh, such a you know, great big group uh, refugees in your country and how is the attitude from the citizens, not government, the citizens to, to refugees because a lot large group there, uh, refugees there, do the local people concerned the refugees will occupy their job opportunities or, or some other resources from the society? Let's repeat the question for the folks online. Uh, so uh, Terry is asking whether in my country, whether this, the attitude of the Ugandans to the people who are coming in, or the refugees and the asylum seekers. And of course, uh, the general attitude is a welcoming attitude. 90% of Ugandans welcome refugees. You will have, even if even in your, in your home, you find someone who may not welcome a visitor, but others have welcomed them. So the same goes in Uganda. Some few people who actually are not even being affected by the refugees, who are not even in the regions where the refugees are, complain about the refugees. Why are we allowing all these refugees in our country when they are not doing anything in their area? So human beings can be funny, but but uh, about the jobs, some of, most of the refugees create their own jobs. In fact, in my country, the, the is, the is, there is a problem of unemployment. So when the refugees come, they are given land, and some Ugandans are a bit lazy, they don't want to till the land. So when they, when they are given free land, because there's a lot of unused free land, they allocate it to them, and then they start working, and they grow crops and they live off the land. Yeah. Great, great story. We have time for one more question. Who's got it? Someone does, we know. <laughs> Susan, I do. So, following up on that, and Uganda, that's enormous refugee camp. I'm not sure if I heard how long people typically stay there. They actually yeah. remain there as long as they want. But as who long wants as. To, I mean, <laughs> Who yeah. wants to stay in a refugee camp? I mean, don't they okay, want to now, now, integrate into society? Oh, no, that's the difference. That's why the UN calls it the Ugandan model. These settlements are actually taken as villages yeah. in my country. It's like a village, like other people where they stay. Because they have land, they go, they go and bed with their children, they, they go home, they have a household. So it's, it's not a controlled place where they have to live and as if it is, as if, as if it is, it is it's a burden. No, we give them land, they, they live like other Ugandans. They integrate in the community around them. The only difference is that they say, this is sub-county, Nelkopa sub-county, and this is another sub-county. That's the difference. So, in this settlement, and by the way, they are not very close even. What, like I showed you on the map, one is in the north, most of the, some of them are in the north, others are in the west, others are in the southwest. So these guys who are in the camps, they, they even intermarry. They, so the life really is, we try to make their life as easy as possible. The only challenge, of course, they are resources because the, the, whereas they have the land which they, they use to cultivate for extra food, 
the help the UNHCR gives them is also not enough. Those are some of the challenges they have. Otherwise, they are not, in fact, they love to remain in Uganda, some of them. Yeah. Beautiful. That's yeah. kind of an interesting, positive yeah. story that we don't always hear about the refugee yeah. crisis. Yeah. So thank you for yeah. all of those yeah. insights. Yeah. 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 Our last of this season's Project Global Conversations will go to that very complex and wonderful part of the world called the Balkans. <laughs> Please join us then. <laughs> Hey, Terry, you okay? Let's get a good picture of the three of them. Yes. Yeah. 